on December 25th, 2008, Karen Walsh wakes up in a home that is not her own, but it's kind of familiar to her. Her head is pounding, her body hurts, and she's aching all over. She can barely remember where she is. There's a little bit of daylight coming out. And she's scared. And then she looks down and Karen realizes that there's blood everywhere. There's blood on her hands. There's blood on her clothes. There's blood on the floor. There's blood on the crucifix. There's blood all over the walls. She's covered in blood and everything around her is covered in blood. So she panics and she reaches over and she finds a phone and she frantically tries to dial a number and call her house, call her husband, but she can't remember the number. What's happening is Karen had way too much to drink last night, but where is she? And she realizes that she just needs to get out of here. But when Karen stumbles out of the bed with all of her strength to fight this hangover, she trips over a body. And that body is her 81-year-old neighbor, Moira. Karen has no idea what has happened but the blood is all over her, so she knows that she needs to get out of this house. And she leaves. Let me give you guys a, a, a little backstory into who exactly Karen is, okay? Karen Walsh is a woman, she lives in Ireland, she's got kids, she's got a husband, and she's even a pharmacist. She has, I'm not sure if she owned this pharmaceutical company or if she had been around working at this company for a long time, but she was a pretty well-known pharmacist. She made good money. And, you know, she was always trying to take care of herself. She was always getting fillers, dyeing her hair bleach blonde because Karen liked to look good. That was one of, that was one thing that she was just really into. It was kind of an addiction for her. And Karen had several other addictions, but for the most part, she lived at home with her husband and her kids. There comes a point where Karen's husband is really done with her other addiction. Alcohol, drinking. Because Karen doesn't just have a couple of beers or take a couple of shots. Karen is drinking entire handles of liquor. And Karen's not the type to drink vodka and then just pass out on the couch. When Karen gets drunk, she wants to yell at people. She wants to beat up on her husband. She wants to get rowdy. And eventually, her husband's like, you're not doing this anymore. I'm done with it. No more drinking in the house. I talk a lot about addiction. And as you guys probably know, if you know people that are addicted or you yourself have struggled with addiction, you cannot just take the thing away from the person. Because that thing, for Karen, that alcohol, it's masking something. It's masking some kind of pain, some kind of internalization, some kind of something. That's what most people do with these addictions. And when you pull them away without giving them a resource to deal with that pain that they're treating the alcohol with, they fly into a rage. They fly into a fury. So you cannot just take the alcohol away from the person. Now, another thing that I talk about with addiction is something that I like to call secret world. You've seen some of my videos or you've been on my streams before. I've explained it a little bit, but secret world is kind of when people that are addicts, they create this little secret fantasy world that they can just enter into, whether it's mentally with their drug or alcohol of choice, and they don't tell anyone and they're really good at hiding it from everyone. Well, Karen had her own secret world and it all started when she met Moira. Moira was her next door neighbor. At the time, she was about 80 years old. And Karen meets her, and she starts off real small. She's like, oh, Moira, so good to see you today. Every day she would leave her house. So nice to see you. Why don't I come in? Why don't we have a drink? And so Karen would come in and, you know, bring a whole liter of vodka. And Moira, being a 
older woman that lives alone. At first, she really enjoys the company, but it starts to get a little bit concerning. And Karen loves going to Moira's house to drink because it's right next door. She can get wasted in a couple hours, stay there until her husband goes to bed, and then just show up drunk, pass out on the couch, and act like it never happened. But look, Karen, everyone knew you probably smelled like vodka the next day. she did you know when you drink like that the alcohol is just seeping through your pores and it's on your breath and everything the next day but that's exactly what karen was doing she was going to moira's house she was getting pretty plastered and then she would just go home karen's number one priority is alcohol she needs alcohol she needs to drink at work she needs to drink when she comes home and no one is going to tell Karen that she can't drink. Not her own husband, not her children, and definitely not her 81-year-old neighbor, right? After a while, things start to ramp up a little too much. Moira's not really a drinker, and so when Karen comes over, this is Karen's ideal situation. She gets to bring over a whole handle of vodka, and it's all to herself. Hanging out in Moira's house, feet kicked up, just chilling. And eventually, Moira starts telling family members that her neighbor Karen is kind of a problem. It's getting close to Christmas. She had gone to see some family members, like, or she had a little event that was on New Year's Eve, and she was telling her, you know, nieces and everyone, she's like, you know, I have this neighbor, and she's. She's just kind of wild. She really, she really be out here. She's just coming over, getting wasted. I mean, she should be at home with her children. And I, I don't really know how to tell her to leave. And, you know, her family is like, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that sounds a little crazy. But it doesn't seem like anything that anyone needs to take action on. It's just a drunk neighbor next door, right? This, this part is f***ing wild. So on Christmas Day, December 25th, 2008, Karen wakes up late in the afternoon on Christmas Day. The woke up after noon that day. And she wakes up and Karen realizes she doesn't have any alcohol that night. Forget the fact that she didn't buy any gifts for her kids or her husband. Karen doesn't have a bottle to drink that night. So Karen goes out pretending that she's going to get gifts for her kids and she kind of just runs down to a 7-Eleven basically, some kind of little convenience store, gets a little knickknack for her husband, gets a little something for her son, comes back with these big old bags and don't worry, the bottle's in the car. And she's like, hi honey, here's the gift, here's the gift. Karen was celebrating Christmas with her family at four o'clock after she had woken up from her hangover the night before and she had secured her bottle for the night. I don't have a lot of details of what transpired after four o'clock during this day, but I can only assume that her husband wasn't having that He has already set boundaries that you will not drink in this house and you need to pay attention to this family and you need to care about us, right? So for Karen to do something so careless for her children on that day, I mean, I'm definitely speculating here, but I have to assume that her husband had some words or maybe there was some kind of dispute. But either way, Karen's up to her old tricks. And by about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, She's knocking on Moira's door on Christmas Day. Oh, God, guys. So on Christmas Day, Karen arrives at Moira's house, already kind of drunk, knocking and banging on the door, telling her, let me in, I'm here, I'm here. And Moira doesn't even come to the door. She doesn't even want to answer for this bit. It's Christmas Day. She's yelling through the door, Karen, what are you doing here? Karen, what are you doing here? Well, she's able to talk her way inside, and Moira lets her inside of the house. Karen's already a little bit drunk, but she's not quite at the bottom of the bottle. And Moira's tired of her shit at this point, because just yesterday she was with her family telling them about Karen's bullshit. They agreed that it was bullshit. So she's kind of ready to stand up for herself. And actually, Moira was getting ready for bed that night. She had one of those ventilators on, you know, that like cover your mouth so that you can breathe and get, you know, your air in before your oxygen before bed. 
this elderly 80 year old woman is just sitting here with her mask on and she's telling Karen, go home. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. It's Christmas day. You need to be with your family. And I bet you that that's exactly what Karen heard earlier from her husband. You should be with your family. And here's Marie sitting here telling her, why aren't you with your son? What kind of mother are you? Now, remember, guys, the biggest triggers, the biggest things that hurt are the things that we know are true and we are running away from. So when Moira tells Karen that she's a bad mother and she should be there with her sons, Karen flies into a rage. She's probably heard this from her family. She's definitely heard this from her husband. She probably sometimes even tells herself this. But for people that have an ego like Karen and a drinking problem, her thought is, you will not say that to me and you will pay for saying that to me because she knows it's true, but she doesn't like this person telling her what she knows is true. So Karen lunges at Moira, 81 year old Moira, and she starts to beat her and she starts to rip her hair out. In the crime scene, there were tufts of bloody hair with the roots attached to them just all over the place. And she starts to rip Moira's hair out and she starts to beat her. And when Moira's in submission, Karen Walsh grabs a large crucifix from the wall that was above Marie's head. This crucifix had a large gold emblem on it of Jesus. And Karen took this crucifix that was a gift to Marie and she beat her so badly that she destroyed her face. She broke 15 ribs in her body and she beat her so hard with that crucifix that the gold piece of Jesus fell off and the imprint of the thorn of crowns was in Marie's chin, covered in blood. And after her drunken rage where she beat this poor woman to death that was just saying what she didn't want to hear even though she knew it was true. If you don't if you don't want to hear the super graphic stuff, cover your ears right now. Right, this has all been really graphic, but I'm saying like this is about to go to another level, okay? And I'll do this when you can um un uncover, okay? After Karen beat her with this crucifix, she wanted to get away with it. And so she sexually assaulted this 81 year old woman with this large crucifix. And I don't know exactly why Karen did that. I don't know if she did it to try to trick investigators into believing that this was a sex crime and a man was involved, or if she was so angry with Moira and she knew that she was a Christian, she knew how much that would terrify her and hurt her for that to happen with her with the cross. Like, it's so like sacrilegious and f***ed up. Like, I, I think part of it was like spiteful, like punishing her almost with her own religion. And that to me is like, I always say we shouldn't be afraid of like killers and things, but Karen Walsh, is tr truly a monster, truly. And I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, and okay, also for you guys covering your ears, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, like, oh, you know, we don't know why, evil monster. She was a monster because she was an, a raging alcoholic and everyone told her to stop drinking and she refused to do so. Oh my God, when I told that, when I think about that part, it, like, it just like hurt, like, I'm just like, I'm like, it makes me very upset. And so, um, Karen, drunkenly just falls asleep in Marie's bed next to the body after the fury and after the release because this is what happens with pent up rage we talked about this a little bit in the Heather Barbera case when these people internalize this deep seated anger and this narcissistic injury the minute that they hit the person or do something, it triggers a release for all of that anger that they've been hiding in. And when you open that, when you break that seal, it does not stop. It only escalates. And that is entirely evident in Karen Walsh's case, which went from punching to ripping out hair to beating viciously to sexual assault, literally. 
Oh my God, I can't believe it. So after that, Karen Walsh falls asleep in Marie's bed. And <laughs> y'all aren't gonna believe this shit. Karen wakes up, like I told you guys in the beginning, not knowing where she is, hungover and confused. She had no idea what she had done the night before. She truly didn't f***ing remember when she woke up. I, like, who, who lets alcohol get to them to that point where it completely controls them? So when Karen woke up, when I was telling you guys earlier, she does pick up the phone and she tries to call her home phone number because she just doesn't know where she is. And she couldn't remember her number. So she hangs up and she just gets out of the house and realizes, you know, she's at a neighbor's house. You know, after the murder happened, no one found Moira's body right away. Karen and some other people kind of start talking about, oh, there were some sketchy looking European people that were hanging around, da 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 da. People talked about that in the neighborhood and it was just kind of like a, because this was only over a day or two, I think that rumor came from Karen because people love to try to misdirect. And maybe it is true, maybe she did try to make it look like a sex crime where a man was involved. Moira is very close with her family and they call the police when they don't hear from her on Christmas. They've discovered her body like right after Christmas. The news breaks and everyone is attending the funeral except Karen Walsh and her husband. And people think that it's a little weird. After they look into it and they find Moira's body, obviously they're gonna, they're gonna, Look through the whole crime scene. They're looking for hair. They're looking to see if there was a fight. They're probably looking for some DNA or something on the cross. But you know what they found that got Karen Walsh arrested? There was blood on the phone. And so they decided to check the phone records. And sometime in the early hours of the morning, somebody attempted to dial four different phone numbers. And they were all very similar. And each one of those phone numbers was eerily similar to Karen Walsh's house number. So investigators are able to tell that Karen Walsh was at that house in the early hours of the morning and was trying to phone home. Afterwards, the family tells investigators that Moira had complained about this woman before and they needed to interrogate her. <sighs> she was arrested and charged on December 27th Karen was saying stuff like, I can't believe this. Like, this is so bizarre. Like, how, how could this happen? The trial started September 2011, and she denied all charges. Karen refused to accept any responsibility. When in reality, and, and I'm not sure what forensic evidence was present at the scene, but I really doubt that a drunk woman covered up any of her tracks. The phone number was enough. It really was. And also the reputation she had in the neighborhood as a raging alcoholic and with the family complaining right afterwards, there was just too much evidence against Karen Walsh. So Karen starts like asking them about plastic surgery for some reason. Like she wants to get some kind of plastic surgery. So the feds realize, oh, she's trying to get a new face and then get a passport and then skip town. So they arrested her pretty immediately, kept her in jail, and then October 4th, 2011, she was convicted of murder and asked to serve a minimum of 20 years. She tried to appeal in 2015, and it was obvious that she had no remorse, and she refused to say that she had anything to do with the crime. So that was denied, and to this day, Karen Walsh is still in jail. Now, it says that she got 20 years, but I don't think this getting out I really don't so this is this is the back piece or this was like the front piece it was a whole gold statue or like bronze or brass statue or something and it was kind of connected let's see you guys can kind of see it like there this is where Jesus was and yep that snapped right in half this case scares the ever-living out of me it really does because like i know some people that be drinking they'd be mad about some shit, and i'd be drinking but i don't i don't, yeah i can't i can't oh god it's just it just like it just really screw it freaks me out 